Welcome to episode 20 of Antlia. We've got a really big fight this turn between Fomoria and Shibaba, and as usual with this game, some unpredictable events. Now, Yomi right now is pleading with Ermor to halt the attack, saying that he will make concessions if they can make peace. Uh, this is pretty funny. I think Ermor forgot to uh, script this assassin. It was set to retreat after pinging this throne, so he just uh, ran away from this sorcerer, which probably would have shredded him anyway. And routes during assassination attempts result in death. Uh, Yomi is raiding with a Dione, so let's check this out. That's a full spread of wolves right there, 1d6, wearing mirror armor, less encumbrance in exchange for less protection, an iron skin, skeletal body, and then blessed itself, and now is just chopping up this PD without any trouble. And out of these invasion battles from Ermor, this I suppose is the more interesting of them. It's for the most part against PD, but Yomi had a few units here, a priest as well as a Oni, but they, uh, as you can see, they didn't last very long. Just small amounts of province defense here in there. I guess there's an Atavi chieftain sitting here, not stealth for some reason. <laughs> and right as uh, Ermor enters Yomi's territory, finds out it's freaking warring states period in here. Lords are vying for power, tons of people are getting killed and running away to Northia. And this is Ermor's response to Yomi's pleas. I'm gonna try to sit a huge army right onto Yomi's capital. Uh, one thing to note of this army is that this commander is sitting in the back of everything, which may be relevant. There's something you you always got to worry about with Yomi when it comes to leaving, you know, a single commander in the rear of your army. But there's not too much going on elsewhere. Ermor is mostly focusing on building up tons and tons of researchers. This war so far has been going very smoothly for him as Yomi has had all of his forces over here and even those forces have been running into a lot of difficulty. And remember behind all of this, Ermor still has this army on his capital and plenty of Histadi in the north of his territory that he's keeping up recruitment on. And Katis has also received a message from Yomi telling him that he tried to get Agartha to get off of his back so that Agartha could help Yomi against Ermor. Uh, this is actually a reasonably sized battle right here. This is Agartha attempting to besiege Katissa's fort. Agartha's coming in with something like 50, 40 to 50 mind blasters, a box of cavern guard sitting in front of them to protect them, and then a whole bunch of Ictiad mercenaries. And Katis has fielded some slave warriors and elite warriors sitting around his province defense along with a few shaman, a sauromancer, and a reborn. So I think the hope for Katis here is to produce enough skeletons to get around the uh, mind blasting spam, but Agartha has brought a lot of units to hold this off, and uh, Katis is rapidly running out of living units, which is going to give the mind blasters uh, very limited targets as they can't target soulless warriors. But this presuming they still have mind blast ammunition by that time the, uh, the mercenaries are routing. Looks like they have ran out. And now Agartha has to fight these skeletons hand to hand. Her cavern guards are routing and now they're reduced to what, life draining these. I'm surprised that works against undead. I don't see any, uh, anything that would make it not work. But do keep in mind that Agartha's prophet is here. is doing a lot of damage to these undead. Oh, but they were routed in this version of the battle. In the original version, things did not go as well for Katis. Very unfortunate because as we just saw, this was close. And if this had gone just a little bit differently, Agartha would have taken enormous losses on her great Olms. Unfortunately for Katis, he may have not known how close this battle was, but hopefully he will be employing this strategy. Maybe with just a few more numbers in the Reborns, this could work out. Uh, did find a troll piñata with a lot of gems in this one and a handful of acorns. This is a pretty handy item, especially when facing a assassination attempts as it pops up three vine men around the commander that's holding it at the beginning of every battle. Now if Agartha is going to try to retain this siege right here, it's going to be a little bit difficult as Katis is, you know, just able to raid out with elite warriors. Looks like he'll be moving up to Agartha's southern territory as well with the same idea. Still with the lizard chariots here in the Forgotten Woods and lizard chum, you know, I really think he needs some reborn. Higher reborn numbers are going to be very difficult for Agartha to deal with, but he is getting some scattered around and as we saw only a couple of death mages in this fight was almost able to turn it onto Agartha and Agartha is still being messaged by Yomi who's asking just about everybody for help against Ermor. Oh nice some uh, infrastructure improvement in Dunster and someone was digging around badger holes for some reason. At least there were some earth gems down there. So yeah Agartha is going to attempt to maintain the siege here. Uh, <laughs> that would suck for Katis interrupt some recruitment onto the Forgotten Woods. At least he's not recruiting any mages there. If it was successful knocking off the PD more armies moving out. Actually
actually, hey, this is a pretty big one moving down toward Bayville, much bigger than what Agartha has up here at Hoburgdorf. Here's the interesting move though. She's moving her pretender down into Embracer. I really don't know what the plan is here with this. Uh, she has it kitted out pretty heavily. Black Steel Tower Shield is a huge shield, fairly encumbering though. A gauche of parrying to increase defense skill a little bit. Black Steel Helmet and Black Steel Full Plate, so a really powerful armor though. A lot of encumbrance from all of this armor, all this Black Steel equipment and Bracers of Protection. Protection 28 is quite a bit. What's the script here? Earth Power and then Legions of Steel. But yeah, not an enormous force. And she has an increased PD here above one. It will be interesting to see what the plan is. Maybe is thinking about invading Oceania at the same time as Katis. Seems a little bit ambitious. It seems very ambitious. That's why, that's why this move confuses me so much. Maybe she's thinking, maybe she wants to hold on to Embracer. I feel like she'd at least pop up the PD a little bit. Yeah, sorry. I don't know, uh, I don't know what to think about this. We will have to see what the future holds. And here is one of the players with the big battle. Uh, first, let's check out his messages real quick. Yomi's deciding that the intel from Shibaba was wrong and is even implying that it was malicious, though I honestly think Shibaba did think that he stood a good chance against Fomoria. And I also think Yomi was the uh, the main person who was wanting to invade. And Yomi is begging right now to, uh, to be left alone by Fomoria. And Shibaba's just saying YOLO in preparation for this enormous fight. So this right here is pretty much everything that Shibaba has. In the front, two boxes of small scorpions, the uh, very large sacred scorpions, who I think are going to be extremely difficult to kill. Some whites chilling up front with their bane blades. A decent number of bats, both the shibalbin variety, as well as some beast bats. And these are all the blood mages chilling around with their cute girl collection. And Fomoria has clustered everything around his mages to defend against flight rear commands. And has some air mages scripted to summon small elementals. Now there's a whole lot going on in this fight, so I'm going to be playing it a little bit slow compared to normal. Uh, the uh, unscripted beast bats that came with the Onaki came down before anything else. And the air elementals are coming down. And these things absolutely decimate these little scorpions because they trample the, uh, the entire squares at a time. Some imps have come down to harass Moria's units a little bit in a way that actually prevents Moria's units from breaking up. And here comes the bats. Which these sun guides aren't very powerful for sacred units because they're low hit points, but they do have a really heavy bless on them and they do hit pretty hard. Uh, the rest of the bats are getting cleaned up by lizards. Here are the main things I'm interested in though, and that's these sacred scorpions right here. This regeneration blood bond is so ridiculous. They're spreading out damage that they take among all of the nearby scorpions, and then all of them are regenerating that damage. So they need to be hit extremely hard, extremely consistently to be killed. Uh, this is not looking very good for Fomori at the moment. He's surrounded by sacred units. These aren't at route yet. Some of his units are routing but not all of them. These furbolg warriors are still holding. And uh, Shibalba's out of blood slaves back here. So this is all we're going to be seeing as far as blood magic goes, these imps right here. And now a bunch of Fomoria's mages are retreating. Not a good sign. These Shibalba and scorpions are holding very strong. But, you know, almost everything is dead from uh, both of these. Is either dead or routed from both of these players. Uh, armies of Shibalba are routed. Not these sacred scorpions. Oh my gosh, this is so close. Oh, scorpions are turning around. Wow. Wow. Damn, Fomoria just barely won this one. <laughs> they're still, they still can't be killed. Uh-oh, these guys are pooped. There's a bunch of, oh, they're flying off now. Wow, so this was a very close fight. And unlike the uh, close fight between Katis and Agartha, we saw it probably pretty close to how it went down initially. Though it does look like Fomoria was able to kill a few of the sacred scorpions in the first fight. We didn't, we didn't see any, I don't think any of the sacred scorpions were killed in the fight we just saw. Shababa has maintained most of his mages, but has lost almost everything else. Some sun guides retreated, some sacred scorpions retreated and the cost for Fomoria was a single furbolg druid and some of his furbolg warriors from orange javelis and a few numidian warriors a very very good trade for Fomoria. like in some contexts this wouldn't be enormously damaging to shibalba but because shibalba is so small he's at such a rough start it is really difficult for shibalba to replenish all of this and Fomoria is wasting no time capitalizing on his victory he's moving these forces forward even without an enormous amount of support a little bit risky with the bats, hopefully that's not going to be a problem for him, is going to try to take back Bakar with a little raiding party and is trying to bring up some units here to Monarch Woods. Maybe to form with this army in a turn or I expect maybe they'll move on to Raspberry Woods together. I think that'd be a very good move. But yeah, things turned right around for Fomori in this war. Like, Ermor of course helped a little bit and he's seeing that now, but he did a really good job holding off both of these enemies in this choke point right here. Looks like he's getting some scouting information, seeing what's going on with Katis depending on 
how this war goes between Agartha and Catis, there might be some vulturing opportunities. It's always something you should look out for is neighboring wars, even if you're not participating in them. If you do see that someone is losing, and I'm not saying that, you know, Catis is going to lose this war here. I think it's way too early to tell. There's a lot that Catis can do. I'd say he's on the back foot for sure, but, you know, Oceania is entering soon. Things could turn right around for Catis. And then that, you know, might open up vulturing opportunities up in Agartha's territory. It's always good to pay attention to that kind of thing, because, you know, even though a lot of people, they don't like it, when you grab territory from a losing player, you are restricting the other player from taking that territory for themselves, which will make them stronger without having to basically attack you. So it is always an important thing to consider. Gamoria is still having difficulty getting his research up, though, because he's committing so much to these fights, especially with how close this last fight was. If he wasn't committing all of these mages to this, I think it very well would have gone a different direction. And Vanheim has received a message from Yomi, who is offering him payment to enter a war against Ermor. Finally getting some blood slaves still not getting any, he's not getting any blood slaves off of Godhaven, and the income is just dropping, plummeting on this province from the unrest. But he did finally get a few. A handful have ge of gems? That must be a really big air gem. No, maybe gems are big. Like, do we actually know how big these are? Using a, a dwarven hammer to make a dwarven hammer, always a good idea. And you know, within a turn, he will be within striking distance of Ermor, and he is recruiting some Heardmans, which are definitely capable of raiding light PD. But down here, he's recruiting surf warriors. I'm not sure about that decision. He has enough Huskarls and Heardmans here to raid light PD, but the uh, these surf warriors with their really low morale, they're just so unreliable. I have a lot of bias against those units. Too many negative experiences with them. But yeah, I'm thinking uh, Vanheim is probably going to enter a war against Ermor, which might relieve pressure on Yomi. Yomi might just barely get saved here, though he's got something moving on to his capital. It's going to be really close if that's true. And here is Yomi's turn itself, eh? and he's been corresponding with a lot of people in this game. Tiss is saying, yeah, he can't uh, help with him because of Agartha, but he'll send him a few gems, uh, maybe help out a little bit. Agartha's saying the same thing, you know, we're too busy fighting Katis, but not giving, yeah, see, who's the real ally, Yomi? Agartha's not giving you gems. The lizards are looking out for you. Vanheim is saying that he is going to uh, attack Ermor, so we'll see if that's true. <laughs> yep, Shababa's going YOLO. I think he's decided that he's probably losing in this game at this point, which I think Shababa's main chance at staying in this this game was taking good fights against Fomoria, and that does not happen. And Oceania is looking like he's going to be attacking Agartha, so probably not going to be able to intervene with Fomoria. Yomi's not able to help. Katis and Agartha are fighting each other. It's pretty much just Fomoria and Shababa staring each other down now. And this message here is Oceania saying that he can't really help with the war against Fomoria and Ermor outside of supporting with gems or items or anything like that. Uh, we know about these battles. Pretty good troll pinata event, though the, uh, the Brazil Zerker pelt isn't enormously useful. Oh yeah, and Fritjof and the captain died from a disease. We were going to see if, yep, he did get a hold of Fritjof's items. So that's pretty sweet. As a potential way to get a hold of items that mercenary captains are holding, let them die in a province with a lab on it if they get diseased. Now, Yomi is moving a ton of stuff to patrol on this capital. This is going to include a couple of Dione, and this is, I think, the interesting one right here. This is an air random Dione, which is very important. The last hope, the Dione because this one can cast flight and then attack rear. If you remember, Ermor only has his prophet leading this army right here, and it's exposed in the rear. So there's a chance it might be staring in the face of a Dione next turn. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, his uh, phoenix reincarnated and actually healed a affliction this time. It had two before. I think it was missing an eye or something. But I guess it regrew it. Unfortunately, it'll be a second before he gets these goblins up to be able to help on his capital. But this could end up going well for Yomi. It's, it's possible with how he has his Dione scripted. Something that I think he should have considered is is maybe sending something to raid Northia, though I think all he has to be able to do that is this Dione right here, which could cut off retreat route in the case that this army is routed. Though I do get, you know, moving this Dione to the capital to try and ward it off that way. But, you know, just an interesting thing to think about is that if this province was cut off and this army was routed on this capital, say with a Malachi attack rear command, this entire army would get wiped out. Oh, so close to Enchantment 3, which is going to open up Fire Shield for him, which is pretty nice on Dione. And Shibalba has had a a rough turn. Yomi is saying that he thinks that they can make it. I mean, I'm not sure about that, but you know, I wasn't thinking that Fomoria was going to make it when Shibaba and Yomi teamed up on him, so we'll see. Yomi might pull through the same. And Oceania is saying that, yeah, he's not able to help outside of offering items and gems. Shibaba did just reach Blood Magic 4, which is going to give him access to Ozolotl, so I don't think it's going to do him too much good. Looks like for the most part, he is in retreat. Oh yeah, let's check out the uh, retreat details of this battle right here. He did lose an Anak him in the retreat, and a few more of his sacred scorpions. Looks like only four of them survive, though he is going to have some
some more here on Swinlin, and he's keeping up summoning on them, which I do think is a big deal. These uh, these scorpions could still do a lot of damage to Fomoria. Up to Thaumaturgy 2. Oh yeah, Shababa has some national spells here. This one does fatigue damage. <laughs> this one breaks people's legs. That's funny. And this one curses. Uh, is, that, is that really why Shababa is researching Thaum 2? Maybe he's thinking about returning? I don't know. But yeah, we already know that Fomoria's armies are on the heels of this retreat right here. So Shababa's small territory is very likely to get smaller very soon. And Oceania has some interesting stuff going on. Very varied series of events compared to all the other players in this game. Yomi is offering Oceania a big pile of gems to attack Ermor or Fomoria. Uh, he did cast Grow Fortress, which is a way to get a free kelp fort. Look at that thing. Do you want to live in that? Well, I guess if you're a water critter, it might be a little more appealing. Whoa! <laughs> he was building all that stuff to put onto his uh, his pretender. That's funny. Making a dwarven hammer. Finally got enough earth gems for it. <laughs> Look at all these attacks. That is, oh, they hit really hard. He did manage to successfully lure two sages into the water and just kill them. So making that throne a little bit easier to raid, though, that might also mean it's easier to raid for Agartha. And then a bunch of Kraken that think they're hot shit wandered into the ancient blue here. I don't think these Atlanteans that were appointed for province defense were expecting this. They thought they worked for the Krakens, but, you know, I guess this, uh, there's no hierarchy here. These are free agents. So something that Oceania will have to clean up at some point. Well, not too difficult as these things are pretty low in protection and defense skill. They just die. Gosh, that MR2 is abysmal. And here is the interesting thing. Oceania is moving a decently sized army with some lesser water elemental support into Embracer at the same turn that Agartha just happens to be moving her pretender here with not that big of an army. So this is really interesting. She's only brought along a few mind blasters. We might see Oceania knock out Agartha's pretender. I'm not gonna lie. To me, that would be hilarious. What's going on here? Oh, some more military right behind that. Does look like, yeah, Oceania is preparing for war here. Not sure what this move is about, though. These uh, sirens being stealthed over to these Krakens. Like, damn, these might just be able to push them off by themselves. So this was turn 21 of Antlia. We've got a couple of interesting fights coming up in the next turn. Or more attempting to siege Yomi's capital and some weird stuff going on between Agartha and Oceania. That's the unpredictable stuff I was talking about at the beginning of this video. So some suspense here and we'll see what happens in the next episode.